Hi guys, Zator here, and today I'm going to be going over the Cold Net LA mixing and mastering. This was a, a track sent over by a, a Reddit user. He goes by, let me pull up his name real quick. Um, uh, his name is Carlo. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, uh, but he sent this over. He was like, hey, can you master this for me? Mix, mix it, do all that good stuff. I said, sure, so let's go over it real quick. Uh, it's not a track with a whole bunch of uh, individual layers or anything. It's pretty straightforward. Just clean this up just a little bit so it's easier to view. Uh, there are a couple of main parts. The biggest part is the drums and the bass. Oh, sorry. So we have the drums. The drums is layer one. There's a lot of different drum samples here, so that was very interesting to, to get down just right. Um, then the bass line is very complicated. Uh, it's It's got a lot going on, so I had to work with that and try and make sure that it didn't get muddied up too much, especially with the amount of compression that I hit it with. Um, then there's some vocal chops, some sound effects, and some percussion here at the end. Um, so let's go ahead and look at... Uh, go ahead and look at the individual channels here. I'll go ahead and turn off the mastering effects that I have over here. Um, so we can hear just how it sounds in context. So real quick, I'll just fast forward to or past the intro so we can really start to see what it hear, hear what it sounds like. So that's without any mastering effects. Uh, let's look at what I do with the drums here. And this is actually true throughout the entire track. Now you'll notice that there's a MIDI pattern underneath of that. That's one that I created real quick uh, for the sidechain. Um, I tried sidechaining off of just the dry or just the drum signal, uh, but the drums change up so much that getting one sidechain or one one consistent sidechain profile wasn't working very well. Uh, so what I ended up doing was just taking uh, an 808 snare, just leaving it unaffected and giving it its own channel and using that as the side chain. Um, so if we look over here in the side chain channel, as the song plays, you can see the MIDI is triggering and it's giving me that perfect uh, side chain profile every hit. It doesn't change. And that let me just set it and leave it as is. And because it's actually a snare and not a kick, I'm not dealing with a bunch of crazy low end. It just gives me this perfect high attack sidechain profile. And I've got the release turned up just a little bit uh, to let the low end of the kick breathe through. Because uh, normally, like if you're sidechaining with a snare, it it hits and it goes away almost instantly. Um, so you wouldn't want to have a long release time on it. It would sound kind of weird. And I've made I've made that mistake before. So I, try, I knew about it this time and I compensated for it. So if we turn off the sidechain, it's still not a huge effect quite yet. That's mostly because the, the bass line is already pumping quite a bit. Hitting it with that sidechain, it pumps it a bit more, but it's not super obvious in the track quite yet. It becomes much more obvious when you get later in the track when there's uh, off time, well I guess it's not off time, but uh, a different drum pattern I should say. So that's, that's why it works out pretty well to have this MIDI here, because I can change up the pattern real quick and individually map these hits. And that's th true throughout the entire track. So if we look at the drum mixing, Really, uh, not too much is going on here. My goal was to boost the kick, the low end, and the snare, and leave the high end a little bit rolled off. It didn't need a whole lot of high end. Um, so I, I left that uh, a little bit... Uh, I took it back just a little bit, not too much. Um, the notch here at the 150 hertz, there was some mud in there with some of the kicks. This one's pretty clean. If you look in here, there's some there's a little bit of mud going in here. There's a little bit of a resonance right there. Try and taper that off. 
turn off the EQ there. Bring it back in. Focuses the drums just a little bit more. Uh, there doesn't need to be a lot going on with the drums in this case. Uh, being more of a dance track, you want kick and snare, and that's the most most of it. And then some high end, uh, like some hi hats and things going on. That's the most important part. The mid range isn't so much of a focus, but you also want to focus on a really tight drum sound. And that was already it was given to me in a good state, so I didn't have to do a whole lot with it. Uh, what did throw me for a loop though with the with the drum track is the different drum samples that were used. So we go from this and that drops back into a much boomier kick drum. So I had to I had to work with that quite a bit. And there's even uh, another drum sample, two drum samples here. This one is a drum sample where all of the top end is filtered off. In fact, everything above 200 hertz is basically gone. Um, and then the next drum sample is a much punchier kick without as much low end in it. So moving into the compression stage, I had to compensate for all of those different elements. So I used a multiband compressor Maximus here pretty hard or pretty I say pretty heavily basically I'm trying to in this case level off all of the low end in the kicks I want them to all or all the kicks to be basically running at the same level throughout the entire track and hitting it with some compression here really helped smooth everything over so that way when you're transitioning from drum samples you're not jumping from one extreme to another you're not going from a very mellow kick drum like here into a crazy punchy kick drum you want that's the exact change that we're doing but having the compressor really smooths it out some and then with the mids i'm trying to do the same thing uh, there's a lot of percussive mids you can definitely hear those so just smoothing those out with the multi-band compression and i dropped the release times back on that because the, the long release times on the mid-range don't really work, in my opinion. I wanted to snap it up a little bit. And that's definitely this... Well, there's like snap effects in the, in the track, so that's what I was trying to preserve. And that also translates for the rest of the track, too. And with the high end, you can see I'm going a lot heavier. Uh, the threshold is about the same, but when it comes to actually compressing, the ratio is a lot higher. Um... So, uh, basically, I'm trying to level off that top end and make sure that this, the hi-hats aren't being aggressively clicky. Like, if, if, you, if you leave the dynamics in there, they can become clicky very quickly and just kind of roll over the mix in a way that's a little harsh, in my opinion. So, this was trying to taper, taper that back. You can actually uh, turn the compressor off. And actually, I am boosting the signal quite a bit, too. As you can see there in the pre-stage. So that was to bring out the hi-hat and then uh, rein it in, I guess you could say. And then some mastering compressor compression, which is actually a little heavy for the track, but it does actually help with pumping the, uh, the high-end. So, or what do I mean here? So the kick drum is so aggressive in this case that hitting it with the master compressor will kind of have give a side chaining effect or a ducking effect to the rest of the, the elements in that track. So I'm kind of ducking the hi-hats in a little bit behind the kick. It's not too aggressive, but it's there. And that, that works with the rest of the side chaining that I've done already, so... It's just a subtle effect, ends up working pretty well. And that's all I'm doing on the drums. I wanted to leave them pretty transparent. Uh, there's no extra distortion or anything, uh, or anything like that. Uh, side chain, like I said, it's just an 808 snare, leaving it at it as is. Um, and then before we get, this is technically after this, or bef yeah, technically after the side chain, but it is percussion, so I grouped it in with the drums here. It's a slightly different color there. We have percussion. 
very light. Uh, I filter off some of the low end just to clear up any rumble that could be there. I didn't hear too much of anything, but just to be safe, roll that off. A fairly big boost in the lower mids, because there's not a lot there, but I wanted to bring out what was there. If you... Let's bring it up just so you can hear. Really not much, just a little boost. Uh, boost in the one, or er, that's a uh, two, three K. Uh, there's not much. I really, or the, the point behind that boost was to make it stand out in the mix without being overly harsh. You can see I rolled off a lot of the top end. If you bring that up, it gets a little papery and harsh. I didn't want that, but I wanted it to still stand out in the mix by giving it a little bit of high end hype, I guess you could say. So I boosted the 3K range, 3,193 3, hertz. Not too much, but just enough to hype it up a little bit. And then that stays mostly untouched. Uh, we're gonna, I threw some compression on it, but this is a, uh, a Thrill Seeker LA plugin. It's a free plugin if you wanna grab it. But this is a, an optical compressor emulation. It is really, really light in this case. Um, it's more of a level, a leveling compressor in this case. Um, I've got the attack and release times turned way up, and optical compressors are already slow. So in this case, it's really just leveling out all everything so it stays a consistent volume, because you can see we have a couple of larger hits here. And I wanted those to be more or less level with the rest of them. So every all the hits stay pretty pretty consistent, which is good. Especially as we get into the end there. They're not getting drastically louder. They are coming up, but not too too much. Oops. And I find that the, the optical compressor is great for that. Um, there's also a little bit of harmonic distortion on that. Uh, just to help add a little bit of sparkle to the top end. It's really subtle. You could get away with having it off. It makes very little difference. It's just a nice little touch. That goes into the side chain where everything else comes in. Okay. I've already gone over the side chain briefly, but I've got the threshold fairly low, and I've, well, I say fairly low, approximately. I guess that's more of a medium threshold. The sample, the 808 snare sample isn't too loud, so I dropped the threshold back just a little bit. But I love the high ratio sound. That's what gives it that little bit of extra pump kind of a sound effect. So that's why I do that. Um, there's no other effects on here. Uh, the ceiling is turned off. Uh, I'm not trying to limit the sound. Also, the compressor section is turned off. That's all that is. Um, then the rest of the effects and everything feed into that sidechain. Um, the first effect, the biggest effect, is this bass line, which, like I've already mentioned, has a lot going on. First thing that does is goes into an EQ, where I roll off the top end. We'll go step by step here. With it off, The first thing that I noticed with no effects on it is that it's a very dark sound. Uh, it was when it was given to me, it fit well with the track. Uh, when you turn, so when you turned up the volume, you could still, you would still get the bassline, but it would be, you would still get the bassline, but it would be a bit more bassy. Um, but because of the way I'm mixing the rest of the track, that wasn't as quite as necessary. It wasn't necessary to have it so dark. And I wanted it to actually function as a as a sound in the track and also be the the sub reinforcement so that's what i went for when i when i approached this so the other thing that i noticed right away was that there's a little bit of a click if you listen to it there's a little bit of a clickiness there that i didn't think worked well for this bass line uh, so when i hit it with the eq i rolled off the just the very extreme top ends. When you do that, you're you're removing some of the attack. Um, when you when we, 
when you roll off the high frequency, you're rolling off some of the attack, not too much, but you are uh, affecting the maximum attack of the sound. So if you listen back to it now, there's still a click. There's a little bit of a click there, but it's much less noticeable. A lot of a click comes in the high frequency, so rolling it off really does help. I'm boosting the mids. And then rolling off some of that same 100, 100, or 100 to 150 hertz to, to get rid of the mud. And you can see that can get really resonant, can add a lot of resonance and boominess to it real quick. And then boosting, actually, yeah, barely boosting some of the sub frequencies and then rolling off everything below 27, 28 hertz right in there. Uh, Later on, there's a, another low pass, or uh, sorry, high pass in the master, and we'll get to that when we get to the mastering section. Next, I've got a boot EQ, which is a vintage tube style EQ. Uh, I set it to a specific preset, which is the preamp goodness preset. Um, it boosts some of the high frequencies, leaves the, mi the higher mids untouched, lower mids get boosted uh, a little bit, 2 dB, 3 dB, maybe, not even very light and then lower frequencies remain untouched and then gives it a little bit of boost in the in the tube section so you get a little bit of a little bit of distortion if you really start to push it let's bring that in I just love the way that sounds. I found that preset works well on just about anything, especially because it is so light. Um, anytime it goes into the red section of the VU meter, that's when you're getting a little bit of distortion. And it's not the normal kind of uh, harsh distortion. Like if you threw Fruity Wave Shaper on there, you're going to get something very harsh. This distortion, since it's emulating a tube, is more mid-focused. It's not giving you a ton of high frequency content it's staying mostly in the mid-range which i really really like that goes into another eq this was just when i came came back around when i had finished up most of the mixing i came back around and noticed okay the baseline could use a little bit more and i this was also to brighten it up just a little bit because there was a there was a bit much low end especially when i came came back around to mastering i noticed hey this has uh too much low end so shelved it off just a little bit and left it basically as is the biggest thing to focus on with tracks like this is sure it might sound better on its own when this eq is off it's a bit bassier it's a bit more focused but that's not going to help us when it comes to the mix down. It's going to sound a little bit too boomy, and it's going to take up a little bit too much space. Uh, the compression that we'll do at the end will really bring that sound back to where it should be. So that's why that's there. And then uh, multiband compression, just kind of like I did with the drums. And in this case, I went ham. There's a lot of dynamics in this sound, so I had to really bring them back and later on in the track there's even like this sort of sound and comparing that to this there's not a lot of comparison there so I had to go a little bit heavy handed on the compression but that's fine to start out we've got some low end compression here and I have it sh I have it limited on the top end here or on the when it gets really loud it gets limited but I don't think it ever really hits that point it stays mostly in just the high ratio compression area and that really helps smooth out the low end and give it some consistency because really that's what you what I was going for in this case. Just 
smooth the baseline out and have it act as the sub reinforcement and not be wild and all over the place. When you turn it on in a subwoofer and there's a whole bunch of low end dynamics, it's probably going to sound pretty weird. And so you want to you want to rein that in to make sure that nothing is just astronomically louder than everything else, you know. And it's, in that case, it's pretty light for most of the track. You can see it's compressing mostly some of the hits and smoothing it over. Mid-range is slammed. That goes from no compression to just straight limiting. And that's partially because of some of this stuff. Turning that off. That gets really percussive. And gating and stuff like that means that there's mid-range everywhere. And in this case, it's a bass line and some higher mid-frequency content. It's important to rein this in pretty heavily. You don't want this rolling over your mix like crazy. And then same goes with the high end. You can see that there's a lot of like really spiky or what would, what would you call that? I guess it's very dynamic is what it is when there's dynamics like that, where that clickiness is coming through a compressor can be your best friend because it can help alleviate some of the problems. It will still be there for the most part, but you can see with those samples that are kind of clicky, it, the compressors, it's clamping down on them and making sure they're not all of a sudden way louder than everything else in your mix. So I'll, I can play that back with and without. So you could hear there that the click was much less pronounced when the compressor was on. And that's really what that's for. There's already not a lot of super high end in this. So the high end is affecting everything past three kilohertz. There's already not a whole lot of stuff going on up there. So I felt pretty confident with just going with a limiting with a limiting style compression. And you can see here in the mixer how dynamic it is. And it with a compressor just brings it up, br brings it up to level and smooths it all over. So it fits right into the mix pretty, pretty effectively. The next bit that we have is some vocal effects. And there is a lot going on with these vocals that it's, it's an incredibly layered sound. There's a lot of reverb in there. It's a very washy reverb. There's some vocal samples, vocal chops, and even maybe some delay in there. So first thing was my favorite tube emulation here, just to bring out some of the warmth in the sound. It's a very cold sound. Uh, no pun intended. But when it came to this vocal, it was very uh, high mid focused. It was a very harsh resonance, and actually you'll see that here. Right here in the 3K range, there was a huge resonance. Like if I turn off all these effects, we'll be able to hear it. Put an EQ here so you can actually see what it's doing. And see right here in the 3K range, there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of stuff going on. So bringing in the EQ to bring out some of that low mid and then uh, hitting or notching out some of that uh, 3K range here with this EQ and then rolling off the low end. It's not really, again, there's not really a lot of low in there, but make sure it's not there. Get rid of it. 
Okay. And then that goes into a wider. Uh, and this is a plugin by Infected Mushroom. It just increases the stereo image, and it can actually give sounds that don't have a stereo image uh, a stereo image effect. It makes everything wide and out. Uh, you can even throw it on just like a single sine wave, and it'll sound like it's stereo, which is a very weird effect. But the other cool part of it is that it doesn't affect phase. Or, well, I say it, I sh shouldn't say that. It does affect phase, but it will sum back together in phase. So even if you throw it on a master bus, your sub will always sum back to mono correctly. And I can actually give you a demonstration of how it would sound on this vocal. At 200%, you can see it's super wide. Like, huge left and right. But it didn't need all that much. It was already a stereo image. But the goal was to just bring it a little bit farther apart. Since the, vo since the effect was drenched in so much reverb and delay, hitting it with this wider effect just brought it out even more. It didn't need a whole lot. But just bringing it that little step farther really brought it brought it into its own. So that's why I used it. That goes into a compressor. Uh, no low, mid, high. It's just a master compressor with a gentle knee uh, into limiting. It's never pushed so far as to go into limiting, but it probably peaks out at a four to one, five to one ratio, maybe even a little bit farther here in the peaks. But that gives it a very smooth compression effect that acts more like that leveling uh, compressor that I used earlier, but in a much more clinical way. This is just something I can control. And then you notice here, there's a, a shelf. Uh, that's a gate. You can see as soon as there's no signal, it, it uh, the compressor clamps down on it. And the reason I did that was there's a little tail right there. There's a little bit of something going on there. So to clamp down on that and give it that gated effect or bring out that gated effect, I put a, an actual noise gate on it. And that just made the effect more trans or more apparent, I should say. There's also some more vocals here. Um, and those vocals also have a, a kind of similar problem with being very strong in the 3K range. And I should have used maybe just one EQ, but I decided to do multiple passes with EQs here to tamper off or to, to tamper that 3K. You can hear now that it's much more mid focused. It's maybe a little dark, but it works well on the track, especially when we hit it with the mastering compression. This works really well. I can remove that one. And that's the effect for the vocals. And later on, there are also some pumping effects, which those do go into the sidechain, but because they were already pumped, I mean, it would sound like that anyway. The sidechain really has negligible effect on these specific vocals. Like if we listen to it, It's already pumped. It's already sounding like it should. Uh, but that effect does taper off. So. And that repeats a couple times. Then the next effect that we have is... Uh, We have the high lead effects. These also were a bit harsh. So my goal was to taper them off some. There was a little bit of some resonances here and there. So to start, I hit it with the wider effects. It was already a little bit stereo, but the wider effect brought it out, just like before. Same preset that I like. And this is actually being pushed really hard. This one is 
staying in the red, that crunches it a little bit, which if we turn off all the effects here, you can hear it's already a little bit crunchy. So the, the goal was to remove a little bit of the harshness and then uh, keep that crunch going. Then that goes into, uh, this is an emulation of an old broadcast style limiter. It's, well, I say limiter. It's a level, it's an old broadcast style leveling amplifier that is kind of like a soft limiter. It's not a compressor per se, but it does some pretty awesome things. Uh, if you push its gain farther, the input gain, it starts to break up and distort a little bit, but not in the normal harsh wave shape type distortion. Just like the tube emulation, uh, it breaks up in a really pleasing way. And it, it can get a little bit overbearing because it is a compressor. If you push the in gain too far, it distorts, but it also compresses pretty harshly. Um, so in this case, I'm boosting the gain just a little bit, 2.6 dB. Um, and then boosting the compression section, it normally starts at uh, 25 dB. Boosting it a little bit more. You can see it's knocking off quite a quite a lot, 7 dB. Um, and then it's got the amplifier section. This is where some of that crunch comes back in. If, you're, if you leave the input gain and the compression kind of untouched, there's not going to be a, a large effect, but you can really dial that in with the amp section. It's a lot cleaner when you leave the amplifier off. So I gave it a little bit more, just a just a bit more crunch, shall we say. And then output stays the same, just zero. Uh, if you push the output, it does some other stuff, but then that just creates problems later on with gain, st gain staging which you can compensate for and it can sound pretty cool, but just left it as is at this point. Then that goes into a final EQ, which I notch out some resonances and that's about it for the sound. There was a bit of a resonance there. I didn't like it. I got rid of it. That's all that was. So that's all of the layers for this track. When you put them all together, You get something that is a bit less harsh sounding than originally. Turn off all the effects here. You get something a bit punchier, a bit more focused, and certainly less harsh and maybe a little bit less resonance going on. And that's all well and good. But let's move on to the mastering section, which is where this track really starts to take off. Uh, I was given a reference track of a, a very upbeat, very fast dance song that was very bright as well. And this song, when I mixed it, it wasn't super bright. That's just kind of what I prefer, but I compared it to the reference track and was like, well, this could be a bit brighter. Um, it could be a little bit less focused on the drums uh, like the kick and snare could be a little bit farther back and that's what what Carlo really wanted. So in the mastering phase, I changed what my goal was. It was to go from a kind of dark ambient house track or dance track or whatever genre you would like to call it into something a bit more upbeat and brighter. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into that. Um, this is a fairly standard mastering chain for me, uh, but there are some pretty cool things going on here that I'd like to get into. Oh, I'll go ahead and close that. So first, Baxter EQ, this is my favorite uh, mastering EQ. It's a shelving-based EQ. It's just got a low and high shelf, uh, but you can do some pretty cool stuff with that. Uh, the preset that I started with is the British Sweetening preset right here. Or, well, actually, there's a drop-down menu. That is not being recorded. Great. Anyways, it's a it's a preset called British Sweetening. 
it gives a little bit more focus on the mid-range. As you can see here, the low end is basically untouched, but the high frequency is boosted in the mid, and it is in mid-side mode. So we'll go, basically the top section is the mid, your mid EQ, and then the bottom section is the side EQ, so left, left, right. When you do that, you can EQ and add more focus into one frequency band in the mid range over the sides. So often what I'll do is I'll boost the mid range in the middle section and then widen out the high frequency to give it a really wide stereo image. That's kind of what is going on here. Uh, the cutoff is at 28 kilohertz and 21 kilohertz for the sides. And then the shelf starts in the middle at 3.4 kilohertz and then for the sides, it starts at uh, 1.6. And then there's a little bit more boost in the mid than in the in the in the than in the sides in this case. And that just is what worked. When you when you when I toggle it, you can really hear the brightness come out in this track. Then that goes into my absolute favorite mastering compressor ever. This is Density Mark III. It's uh, another free plugin that you can grab. You just knock 4 dB or so off of your mix, and it just smooths it right over. Uh, it's a very gentle compressor. It works fantastically on really complicated sources, which is why it's perfect for mastering. There's so many different elements going on. This just handles it really well. Uh, for instance... Or for example, the Thrill Seeker LA plugin that I used earlier, the Opto Compressor, because it's so slow, it can really it can smash your mix in an unpleasant way. Uh, it can give a a pumping compressor effect that isn't in time if it's not set up properly, and can really just roll over your mix. And in my opinion, it doesn't sound great for mixing. It sounds great on guitars and that sort of thing, but when it comes to mixing, this compressor is very gentle but at the same time can handle basically anything you throw at it. So to start, let's turn that on. As you can see, I have it set to knock off just about four decibels. Uh, the range knob is a maximum amount of compression. So turning it off limits it to like a dB or two of compression. Bringing it up limits it to about four dB right where it starts to sound good and I didn't really need the limit on here um, boosting the input to where it was knocking four decibels off most of the time uh, because my mix is kind of consistent it I didn't need to limit its maximum compression I just left it uh, to work on its own and that worked out and then in the drive section, I have it boosted just so where it's just so where it's knocking off the the 4dB. The left and right channels are linked right here because we're in stereo mode. And then the timing is a bit faster. Uh, it's been on the faster side. There's P1, P2, and P3, P4, P5, P6, all that. Uh, those are just variable timings. You can go with a slower timing or faster timing, and then you can really get in there and tune it to where you like with this to make it faster or more strict or relaxed. I just left it default for P2. Um, there's also a color section. In this case, I didn't use it, but it can make your sound a little bit more low mid focused or, or what you would call a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler. Um, I left it as is. Uh, I wanted transparency, so left it blank. And then I'm boosting the makeup gain on the compressor just a little bit. And that's just helpful for gain staging. Not using any other features on this right now. Um, and really, it just, it just works. It's perfect. I throw it on basically everything because it just works and sounds great. So that's it's so much fun to use that one. Uh, Fruity Convolver. This is where the high pass comes in. This is a uh, it's a linear phase EQ. So it adds delay to your signal but leaves the phase relationship of all of your frequencies intact. Basically what that means is that 
when you're using a normal EQ, say parametric EQ2, when you've got a signal here, band pass might actually work really well here. When you're shifting it around, and actually even when you're not, you are affecting the phase and therefore the pitch of your signal. So when I'm moving this around, it becomes very obvious. The low end starts to go all over the place. You can see here, when I'm not moving it, it's very clean low end. When I shake it around, it goes nuts. You are messing with the phase of the sound when you're using uh, an EQ like this. So to avoid that, you add some delay to your signal and you let the, conv in this case, Fruity Convolver, process the signal and just remove that low end. It's not super necessary and you can totally get away with just dropping in an EQ and shoving off the low end. But there is actually another feature of a linear phase EQ. And that's that this curve here, that's the actual EQ curve. That There's no Q, there's no nothing, it's just there is nothing going on below 26 hertz. And actually I could even go a little higher, but I'll just leave it at 26 hertz for now. That is the curve. It is it obliterates everything below 26 hertz, which is fantastic. And we can even do some crazy shapes like this, where we want everything from 200 or 300 hertz to uh, 400 hertz to just have a random boost in it. Or we can also notch out that frequency range. forgot to turn it on. Of course I did. I was like, why isn't this working? There we go. You can see right there, there's that resonance coming through. And that, that can be really helpful. I don't really use this for mixing, or, but only really when I'm mastering, because this is not something that you just make quick adjustments to. It's something you set kind of deliberately and it's very clinical. And this, uh, with the normal EQ, I can just kind of throw throw parameters around, be like, okay, that sounds good. We'll, we'll leave it at that. This is far more deliberate and clinical. Oh. Didn't mean to do that. I don't need a piano right now. Okay, and then that, following that, it goes into a, a dynamics processor. In reality, what it is, is a tape style emulation. So it's as if you were recording the sound to tape and then playing it back. It's a very mild effect in this case. I don't want too much of it. I don't want it rolling over the sound, and I definitely don't want it reducing the fidelity of the, of the track but I do want a little bit of that warmth that you get off of a tape. Like if your tape is running a little bit slow, you get that really fat low end. Um, that's the kind of thing that I want. So I'm hitting it with some saturation and then a little bit of limiting, just barely, It like the limiter just touches the sound occasionally. And that's a very mild effect as well. There's really, it's a really light effect and it's mostly apparent in just the low end. So I found that it works, but it's totally up to you whether or not you would use that sort of thing. The last major element here is ozone elements. This is just a, a plugin I picked up. I was trying it out and it, and it worked out pretty well. I don't really use it so much for the EQ, but it's very helpful when it when it comes to its parameters. Like it's got a it, its visualizer works fantastic. And actually, let me throw it on here. So this sort of visualizer, this is the only plugin I have that actually has this sort of. I don't know what kind of or it's a spectrum analyzer. I'm not sure the exact name for this but it gives me a different view than the normal Fruity Parametric EQ. This is what I'm used to looking at. 
and this is great for looking at the relationship between frequencies, but it's not really helpful when you, you're trying to find something that's significant, like that one little resonance that's significantly louder than everything else. You can totally do that with parametric EQ, but this sort of a plugin is very useful for that sort of thing because it shows you the actual value or the, the volume of a specific frequency. That's what really kind of sold me on, on getting it. I know there's some other plugins that do that. Like uh, FabFilter does that. Uh, but this one also has uh, an imager. Uh, you can see uh, the stereo image. And that's also pretty helpful. And then it's also got some maximizer controls that I personally don't use. I use a separate uh, compression uh, plugins for that sort of thing. So it's not super useful here. Uh, but what I do use use it for in this track specifically is its mastering assistant, which is a fantastic feature because this plugin analyzes the audio and balances it for me. So no matter what my monitoring setup is, no matter what I'm listening to this track on, it will go through and slide some things around just to get it just right. So it's not too bright, it's not too dark, the bass isn't rolling over everything, it's just right. If we look at it here, oh. oops, did I remove the wrong one? I don't think I did. I removed the settings. Well, I can just go through the mastering system real quick, because it'll do the same thing. So you can see here, what it's done is it's analyzed the audio and said, hey, it needs a little bit more in the 6K and 10K range and a little bit off the really lows. And that's it. And it looked at the audio and said, hey, here's what you need. And in my case, like, say my room isn't quite perfect. There's a, an odd resonance over here or the bass doesn't work right over here. It ignores that and just says, Here's what it kind of should sound like. It gives me a really good idea for what I might be missing. It's fantastic. That feature alone is game-changing for me anyways. And then it's also got some maximizing uh, effects. I'm not too familiar with this. I'm still learning this one in particular, but sounds all right to me. And then finally, that goes into a Maximus. which isn't doing anything but compressing the top end kind of aggressively. It's got a bit of a knee, but that's all it's doing before it goes to my final limiter. And that's just to get the... the uh, that's just to get the loudness of the track up. Just make it louder. This is a dance track. should be loud. Um, there's not really a whole lot of dynamics that really need to stand out. It's not. There's not softer sections and louder sections. There's not huge hits going on. This track is pretty focused on being a dance track. So it should be louder. And that's basically everything. Just going through the individual tracks, seeing what needs to be corrected, and then pushing it hard. A lot of these, if you notice here, and I can pull this back up, some of these tracks aren't very loud, or I should say, there's not a lot of uh, dynamic range to work with. They're kind of quiet. Um, so you, in my case, I wanted to push them a lot harder. I wanted to bring them up and have them be in, in focus, I would say. I want them to be part of the track and I want them to steal your focus. So pushing them a bit harder was definitely the way to go in this case. Anyways, I think that's basically everything. If you do have any questions, please let me know. Have a nice day.